Okay. I'm trying to show this in a in a way where we can like see the timeline. Because if I'm not mistaken, is it because okay, Zeno or not not Zeno, um Parmenides comes from what was a part of the Persian Empire and which is modern day Turkey. He goes to Magna Graecia, which is in Italy now. And um was Pythagoras there before him? Does he is he going to the Pythagorean? Or, so he so he basically joins this Pythagorean movement happening in Magna Graecia. Uh, Parmenides. Parmenides. Yeah. Is that what well, happens? I, I haven't seen any evidence that he joined the Pythagorean okay. order, but, but that's what I'm asking. But, Are they separate? No, Pythagoras okay. was first. Pythagoras is first. Parmenides yeah. comes from from the east, sets up in the same general area as Pythagoras, but they have two different schools. Now, is this where Heraclitus? Is he t learning from both of these people? Is he coming? Because I think Heraclitus. Well, no, is Heraclitus. Both of them. Right. But I'm saying Heraclitus, where does he fit in between Pythagoras and Parmenides? Is he one of their, is he part of one of those schools or is he a completely different school? Are, they th are these three yes. different schools? Different school. Different school. So we have and three the, different schools. At least. Gotcha. The interesting thing is that Heraclitus hated Pythagoras. They were both coming from out of the Persian Empire. I don't mean just yeah. geographically, right? Remember, Pythagoras studied for over a decade with the Magi, and then Heraclitus was invited by Darius to become the court philosopher of Iran. So they're both coming from out of this Persian spiritual, intellectual background, and yet Heraclitus hates Pythagoras and takes a few jabs at him in his fragments, where he basically right. says, guy like, he's like, uh, charlatan who came up with some like new agey cosmopolitan yeah, doctrine yeah, yeah. and whatever. Which is true yeah. though. Well, okay. So yeah. now, now, now I just want to lay that out. We have these three schools that are all three of them seem to be somewhat tied to Persia. They both come to Italy or they all come to, um, Oh no, I'm talking about those two. And then Heraclitus has his own thing. Now, Plato, who is coming a century and a half later after Socrates is learning about these schools, which uh, which are these other pre-Socratics now? So my question is this: This is very interesting what you're what you're laying out because we have these three schools of thought. Is Plato trying to unify them? What is what is he trying? And what is what is his goal in 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 like strawmanning these brilliant thinkers? What is he trying to do with these three schools of thought? Yeah. Okay. This is really the question. Okay. This is really the question. So in order to answer that, we need to step back and look at the world into which Plato was born. Okay. And the time, the time, you know, and society uh, of these men that we've discussed so far. Homer is often misunderstood as a literary figure and as a poet in the contemporary sense. That's not at all the case. If you read the Iliad and the Odyssey, and particularly the Iliad, which is believed to be actually older than the Odyssey, and there's some question about whether the Odyssey, you know, the Iliad and the Odyssey were both oral traditions. And this Homer, who at some point wrote them down, was a particular bard who sort of codified what was for a long time before that, centuries before that, an oral tradition. Uh, but the world that's revealed by the Iliad and the Odyssey is one where basically people are the playthings of fate uh, and, you know, are at the whim of the gods and don't have hardly a, a thought that's their own or a conscience of their own. At yeah. any moment when someone, quote unquote, comes up with an idea in the Iliad, it's because some god suddenly came in and gave them a particular inspiration. Like Just Eros. Thought into their e Eros yeah. comes up with his bow and strikes you, and now you're in love with somebody. That's, yeah, that's or the idea. Achilles is seized by anger, or when Achilles is seized by anger, or when, you know, any passion that seizes a person is attributed to the influence of a certain god. Uh, and they would hear these gods, and sometimes they would see these gods. And there's no sense of personal conscience all of the actions taken by the heroes or the villains in the Iliad uh, uh, are, are basically either dictates of one or another god, or they reflect some deeply ingrained social custom and ritual. 
we're dealing with a completely ritualistic society of custom, an incredibly conservative traditional society, wherein there was no distinction even between nature and culture, right? Like the, the same way that birds had certain habits, they had a certain way of life that was proper to them. It was proper for women to be in the kitchen, you know, and to like take care of the domestic sphere. That wasn't considered an aspect of a particular culture and the migratory uh, patterns of birds are an aspect of nature. The distinction between nature and culture is something that was defined by the first philosophers to sure. begin with. It didn't exist in the world, world of the Iliad. So all of these actions taken by various figures like Agamemnon and Achilles and so forth in the, in the Homeric world are either based on what was expected customarily or they are, uh, you know, they're things that the gods commanded. There's no personal conscience or sense of free will even that would allow for conscientious action. And the other important point is that the medium of the Homeric, uh, well, let's call it whatever, sagas, the medium of the, of the ep Homeric ep epics was something akin to rap music it was it was recited and performed in a way where the the tempo uh and um modality of the poetic performance was meant to sort of contagiously move the audience in a way where they embodied the message being delivered through the medium a book that's been written about this is uh, Eric Havelock's Preface to Plato. So I, I refer people to that, Havelock's argument in Preface to Plato, where he's saying that we shouldn't think of Homer as poetry in anything like a contemporary sense. It's more like a cultural encyclopedia yeah. of, like, for example, there's huge passages on shipbuilding in the Iliad, like how to build ships. He's the internet. That knowledge was transmitted through this poetry, quote unquote, okay, no, via the, the oral Orphic, The Orphic and Homeric hymns are the pre predecessor of the internet. Is that, would you, would you agree with that statement? Well, there's something to that in the sense that the internet is becoming uh, yet again a, a kind of highly mimetic medium. The, the core idea in Eric Havelock's study, Preface to Plato, is the idea of mimesis or mim, uh, mimicry, like action that's highly imitative in which there's no reflection, right? So it's like, you know, highly imitative embodiment of the message being conveyed by a medium without any uh, personal reflection or critical thought about it. And so this is exactly what takes place today, let's say, with bad rap music. Not, not the kind of rap music that occasionally has like thought-provoking messages to it yeah, or yeah, yeah. like revolutionary political rap, but like gangster rap, you know, the old bling bling gangster rap about yeah. money and cars and hoes and et cetera and whatever, right? And the people who listen to this rap, and you can see them like on subways when they look and they're moving their bodies in a certain way well, as they listen to the rap. The Bacchic revelers were like this. They were just full energy, full, just going with it, just going hard. Like that yeah. was what, that would be the equivalent of what that rap is. Yeah. And so when you say the internet is like that, it's because in a way, like we are being, uh, we are being, how can I put it, uh, barbarized or kind of like uh, being reduced again to a kind of pre-rational, pre-reflective state through the intense mimesis, the mimetic power of the internet, right? It's, okay, that's a whole critique that, that's a yeah. side conversation. But point being, Plato was dealing with a society where that's what poetry is. And this poetry is totally corrupting children with all kinds of stories about, you know, sadistic and manipulative gods like Zeus, who use people as their playthings and engage in, you know, rape all the time on, you know, using various disguises. Um, and so, so he considered this totally deleterious to the development of the moral fiber of children. And 
when he bans the poets in his Republic, this is the kind of poetry he's talking about. He's not talking about poetry in the contemporary sense. He's very specifically taking aim at Homer.